Hi, in this segment we're going to study what it means to say that we are made in the image and likeness of God. So let's jump in. There's an incredible um, statement by God at the end of the first five days of creation and we have this discussion amongst the Trinity, starting at verse 25. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 26-27. You know, this is truly an astonishing text in so many different ways. In which the Trinitarian God purposes to make a different kind of being than he had created thus far. One that would image him. Not to be him but be his image in his likeness, which is something that uh, we shall discuss. Who are we and what are we? You know, why curse questions for me, as opposed to how questions, have haunted the landscape of my heart and brain ever since I can remember. You know, why? Why does this happen? Uh, why does that happen, and who are we, and uh, just those kinds of purpose of types questions. What is our identity? God answers that for us very clearly in this text. Since we are made in God's image, then we cannot know who we are or what we are without knowing who or what God is first. And that's one reason why we look at him first in our study. As John Calvin noted in the first pages of his uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves are inextricably connected at a thousand different points. And there, there's a crisis today, not just in philosophy, but in our culture in general regarding purpose and identity. If you were to ask the average person on the street, you know, what's your purpose in life? I think they'll probably stare at you and say, I have no clue. Or, or who are you? I mean, we're talking about basic questions as to why we are here. But if we jettison the living God, which we have as a whole in our culture, then it comes at a very high price. Human dignity and purpose go out the window. So our country is becoming increasingly barbarous in which we're slaughtering the unborn. This would be one example for sure. You know, perhaps the hardest book I've ever read was Jean-Paul Sartre's book, Being in Nothingness. In it, he stated this that existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. Think about that for a minute. You, me, the chair you're sitting on, chair I'm sitting on, all the facts, all the particulars in the world, th that's existence. Those are facts. And what Sartre is saying is that they just exist. There's no essence to them, no meaning, until we choose, in his words, in an act of courage, to give them meaning or essence in an otherwise absurd world. Or to put it another way, there's nothing outside of us to give essence or meaning to our lives. On the other hand, you have the other existentialist, Albert Camus, who asserted that because of 
our godless condition, the only question, true question remaining, is should we commit suicide? It's awful, isn't it? So the credo of the secular humanist or pagan is this. I originated in meaninglessness, and I am destined for meaninglessness. But in between these two poles of meaningless, my life is magically imbued with essence or meaning. Gosh, talk about a leap of faith and of absurdity. That is the sad situation of modern man. You know, if we are but cosmic accidents, personal warts on the face of an impersonal universe, then our origin and destiny are equally insignificant. There's no basis for human dignity or worth. And the 20th century is a murderous testimony to the inevitable fruit of that kind of thinking. That is, man is a measure of all things. We have become zeros, less than zeros, really. Our origin, destiny, and meaning are tied to God. He declares that we have essence or meaning, value and dignity. God alone has intrinsic dignity and value, but he has assigned us extrinsic value and dignity. We are made in his image. Okay, now what does that mean? Now some have suggested, particularly Roman Catholic theologians, that image and likeness refer to different things, but the structure of the Hebrew indicates that they are synonymous, and the Bible uses these terms interchangeably. So what does this um, imago dei mean? And I can tell you that tons and tons of ink have been spilt over this issue. I mean, we're talking... Hundreds of books have been written over the centuries about what this means. But you know, y'all, the short answer as to what the image of God means, I think, is still profound. And that is what it means to be made in God's image is that we image Him. I mean, isn't that what images do? Images express likeness to something or someone else, right? It mirrors or expresses what the original is like. You know, just a hundred yards away from my apartment is a national military park commemorating the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, and especially General Green, whom our city, uh, city of Greensboro is named after. Now, General Green was Washington's brilliant leader of the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War. And ever since I was a kid, we used to go see this enormous image of him on horseback, and it's still there. This image of green, in all its immense, enormous dignity, is designed to portray or represent green. His dignity, his honor, his brilliance uh, as a military strategist. You know, there's images of all kinds of people that are uh, are important and all over, you know, the world. So as God's image, we are to image him to the world. We were created with that express intent or purpose. But that's at the heart of our humanness and identity and purpose. We are to mirror to the world what God is like, his holiness and love. Walking and talking images is what we are. And in our behavior and words, we are to express his character to all the rest of his creation. So that we adorn the gospel, people look at us and can say, Hey, that's what God is like. We mirror to the animals, the angels, and other people, God. We do not exist for ourselves, but for God. And he designed us with unique and incredible dignity. Since we are God's image bearers, um, there may be one reason for the second commandment. And the main reason is because since God, you know, don't have images of me, is because God is spiritual. And the, out of respect for God's infinite uh, holiness and um, honor, no image should be made of him, but 
it's been suggested that it also respects our dignity in that there's already one image of God that he created, and that's us, and to be only us, which shows our dignity. We are, we are an exception to that, that commandment. We, we are images of God. So to be more specific, we are like him in some ways or analogous. You know, though he's the creator and we are creatures, we, are, we alone are made in his image. God is holy. He's creative. He's rational. He's communicative. He's gregarious, meaning he's relational. He has a will, and we're to mirror to the world all these things. His holiness, for example. Likewise, though we cannot create from nothing, as his image bearers, we can create beauty, whether it's in the home, the garden, or on a canvas. We mirror God's creativity when we create, and this pleases him. All the traits I mentioned we share with him, which make up our image bearing. In a word, God is personal. He is infinite personal. He's an infinite personal God. And we are finite personal. You see the distinction there? He's the infinite personal God, and we're finite personal. We may not be able to verbally express what a person is, but we know instinctively what a person or personality is. And we are finite personal, as opposed, again, as I said, God is infinite personal. We are finite and personal persons. That gets at the heart of what it means to be in God's image. He's personal. We're personal. Immediately after the verses describing our being made in God's image the first time, we are said to be his under-shepherds and ruling and caring for his earth. It's called the cultural mandate. We are to reflect God's righteous rule over the cosmos and how we build culture. And that's a crucial aspect of our image of Godness. The view of the image of God is contrary to a, what I call a platonic view of spirituality that is pretty common in Bible-believing churches, in which there is a spiritual compartment and a non-spiritual compartment. Plato taught that the soul was all that counted, and the body was the prison house of the soul. Matter, stuff, was inferior to the spirit. But we must resist this super-spirituality, this platonic tendencies which dehumanizes the whole man. True spirituality sees the Lord Jesus Christ as King and Lord over the totality of life, the arts, government, academics, and of course everyday life, our relationships. It also means that of all people, Christians should be the most sensitive to environmental issues, the most excited about the humanities and sciences knowing that we do have dominion over it, whereas the secular environmentalists deny that. But obviously we are still not to recklessly um, rape you know, God's good earth in advancing culture. That we should, that we will live forever is perhaps another way that we image God. Though God alone is immortal, our souls are not intrinsically immortal, as Plato taught. We live forever only because God decrees it so. Our soul is not made of, you know, intrinsically immortal stuff. No, that's, like I said, that's Platonic. Um... Notice that it is the intra-Trinitarian communication in which we are discussed as being made in our image. So as a communicative triune God, what we say and how we say it is a salient aspect of our image of Godness. 
language and the ability to communicate is an expression, an important expression of our image of Godness. Like God, we are rational, creative communicators. We have a spiritual side, so our image of Godness is rich. Some have suggested that since we were created with bodies and will have bodies forever, then they in some sense reflect God's image as well. Though God is spiritual, but remember the glorified incarnate Christ has a body. Scripture says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So perhaps, you know, that image is God's wisdom in our, in our bodies. I'm not sure. Notice, too, that it um, says that male and female comprise God's image. We need both to complete this image. This further enriches the beauty and the multifaceted nature of God's image. We are told that God himself brought Eve to Adam in the garden chapel. It was like the father walked his daughter down the holy aisle to join hands with her husband in a marriage officiated by God himself. Last segment, we talked about the consequences of the fall and the ghastly things that happened. The image of God in us was severely tarnished and our ability to, to mirror God's holiness has been greatly affected. Our hearts, minds, and wills have been adversely affected. The mirror is fogged. I had mentioned that the fall has much explanatory power regarding the world and ourselves. And a powerful example is how the creation, the image of God, and the fall, those three things, creation, the image of God, and the fall, they alone can adequately explain the paradox of mankind, the simultaneous majesty and misery of mankind. The history of the world bears this out over and over and over again, where you have on the one hand breathtaking expressions of our singular nobility and potential for such beauty on every level, including relationally. At the same time, we are capable of the most horrendous inhumanity to man, or on an everyday level, just our pettiness and selfishness. We are studying contests, majesty, and misery. When we say the Bible is true, we mean that not just in the spiritual matters, but it alone expresses and explains the complexities of the world we live in, including ourselves. So when the Bible says it's true, it's really, really true across the board. Note that biblically, though we are the pinnacle of creation, we are not the goal of creation. The last and most sacred day is the seventh day, which focuses on God. The sixth day is penultimate, but the ultimate day is the seventh. Perhaps... A little bit of speculation here, but perhaps that explains, at least in part, the meaning of 666 in Revelation. This number, think about it, we were created on the sixth day, the penultimate day. This number elevates part of creation, us, as the ultimate and then, in Jewish categories, raised to the highest power, the third power. When they wanted to accent something, they didn't underline it. They repeated it. For example, in Isaiah, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So what you have here is God is dethroned in this antichrist scheme and mankind six is elevated to the third degree the highest degree as a measure of all things and imaging not god but satan i think that's the essence of 666 perhaps and then of course some person will come along that personifies the satanic scheme but we must remember that we don't exist for ourselves, but to mirror God. 
There are two extremes regarding the results of the fall that we need to avoid and how it relates to the image of God in us. On the one hand, some virtually deny that it affected us at all. Pelagius, back in the time of Augustine, did this, and Augustine um, and Pelagius did battle over that, not physically, but Pelagius basically asserted that the fall had little little effect on the, the spiritual aspect of man. Um, we'll we'll come back to that pretty soon uh, in upcoming segments. But others say that the image of God was totally destroyed. Um, as I said, we'll deal with that first there in depth at a little later time. But regarding the latter the image being totally destroyed, the Bible is clear that we're still made in God's image. Though, as I said, the, the mirror has been fogged. We're still in his image. Genesis 9-6, 1 Corinthians 11-7, and James 3-9 make this clear. Let me quote from Genesis 9-6 first. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For... God made man in his own image. Now, obviously, Genesis 9, this is post-fall, post-flood. And then from James, with it, the mouth, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. It's all new perception, uh, perspective on uh, gossip. Then it. We're still humans, and the goal of redemption is to restore our true humanity in all its earthy, lovely splendor. The goal of salvation is degree by degree restoration of God's image in us. And the restoration of you know, the fullness of the image of God in us is being accomplished by Christ. He is, as Hebrews 1, 3 says, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So, we can say this, sanctification, in one sense, is the restoration of our true humanness. Not the squashing of it but the restoration of our true humanness as his image in all its rich fullness is restored degree by degree. So in summary, one, God created human beings, both male and female, in his image and likeness. Two, there is some analogy between God and mankind that makes communication between them possible. Three, Human beings like God are moral agents with the faculties of mind, will, and creativity. Four, humans are called to have dominion over the earth, subdue and build culture, but not rape it. Five, in the fall, the image of God in us was marred. Six, and lastly, Christ is the perfect image of God, and he is restoring us to the fullness of the image of God. Father, thank you that you have made us in your image. What an extraordinary privilege that is of all your creatures to be made in your image, to mirror to the world your holiness and love. And I pray that increasingly through the way that we live and speak that your holiness and love would be manifested in and through us to a very dark, lost world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Find this.